Let's look at Jude chapter, Jude, verse 24, right? Verse 24 and 25, we're going to read those. Uh, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Verse 25, to the only God our Savior be glory and majesty and power and authority throughout through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Let's just pray for God to bless our time. Father God, just uh, Lord, just give us what we don't have, uh, the ways that we're not like your son. Father, form us into his image. And Father God, in the ways that we lack in love like, like precious Jesus, Father, may your word and your spirit work in our lives to make us more and more like your son, the only perfect human being, the precious one who gave it all for us. And as we look at in Jude today, will keep us, will keep us to the very end. And so, Father God, I pray for your, your spirit to speak through your word to your people. And the infallibilities of me, the weaknesses that I have, Father, move those out of the way that your spirit will speak to your people and will encourage their spirits. And Father, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Probably, um, as we look at this sermon about being kept to a fault, or from a fault, actually is what it should read, um, you've, you've had the experience of probably falling, right? Most of us, at some point in our lives, when we were two, and we were learning to walk at nine months, or we were two, and we were running faster than we could go, right? My mom used to say, your feet can't keep up with your face because my face was head planting on the ground and on the coffee table and, and on the sidewalk and I had all these bumps and bruises in the pictures and then when my son came along he, he was just like his father led head first into everything bam, bam, bam like a heat seeking missile there was lots of falling, right? stumbling precedes falling but, but the big thing to keep from falling from stumbling is to be sure footed and often to be sure-footed takes someone else. When Kim and I were first engaged and when we were in love in college, and we're still in love, but when we were in college in love, I should preface that, right? Uh, when we were in college in love, uh, she used to, we'd go to church and you dressed up at this First Baptist Church down there in Durango and we would walk together because it gave us time to be young lovers together and enjoy each other, get to know each other and stuff. We'd walk to church and it was beautiful there. And in those high heels that she had, she often would fall over those broken up sidewalks, right? And so when she would fall a little bit, she would jerk on me and tug on me, right? And I was her support to kind of be sure-footed in those heels, right? And over time, we kind of find that in our lives, if we live long enough, we stumble, we fall. At the end of each of our lives, if we live long enough, we're going to stumble and we're going to fall a lot part of being human but what I remember as a father was this and I'll close this part of the illustration was that when Greg was learning and he was little and he was stumbling and falling when he was holding on to my hand he would lose his way and hit the deck break his neck right but after watching him fall a little bit what he would do is when he'd stand back up I'd help pick him back up instead of him holding on to my hand I would hold on to his hand and then after that, because of my sure because of my strength, the little guy wouldn't fall thereafter, right? And that's the passage that we're in before this morning, is, is this idea that Jude gives us that even when we're weak, even when we're in a bad place, even when we fall, even when we're hurting, even when we're at the lowest point, God is not going to let us go, amen? Now that should encourage you. That should encourage you this morning. This entire week, having nothing to do with the hospital, I mean, having nothing to do with the high school, I have dealt with death call after death call after death call after death call. Five, six, seven people, people in ICU, people fighting for their lives, and that's not even including the high school. It's just been one of those weeks. And what I've been at, just blessed with is to watch how God continues to work in people's lives and to hold them unto himself and how his grace continues to hold them when they no longer can hold on to him. Amen? That should encourage us this morning because all of us are going to have the bad day. All of us are going to have the low points. All of us are going to have the times when we slip, and I've been there too. 
when we're weak. And God says in the text before us today that he is going to keep us, right? He will keep us from stumbling and present us before his glorious presence. How? Without fault and with great joy. That should be an encouragement this morning. Now, as we look at this little, little letter of Jude, you know, if it's one of those things that if you've got a thin line like me, if you blink, you miss the whole book, right? It's right before Revelation, 25 verses. And it's written by Jude, who says in chapter 1, verse, well, it's the only chapter, right? Verse 1, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. This is written by the brother of James's brother, Jude. This is a half-brother of Jesus who writes this text, okay? This is someone on the inner circle with Christ. This is someone that would know him well. And so Jude writes this thing, and he tells us in verse 1, to those who have been called, he's writing to believers, who are loved by God the Father, and listen to this, and kept for Jesus Christ. He begins his little letter with this idea of being kept unto the Lord, being kept for the Lord. These people were struggling. False teaching had entered into the church that Jude is writing to, and it was causing problems. It was causing people to leave the Lord. It was causing people to doubt the faith and to leave the faith and to walk away from Jesus, what's often called apostasy. And Jude is calling his people, you who are called by Christ, you are in Christ, you are kept by Christ. And if you have Christ, he says, he goes on, he says, contend for the faith, right? Contend for the faith. Stick with it. It's a call to perseverance, and it's a call to us today to persevere. Jude is writing to God's people and saying, contend for the faith. Stick with what you know, with what sound doctrine, or what you've been taught. Verse 4, he talks about these individuals that were moving in, right? He says, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality, and they deny Jesus Christ our sovereign and Lord. They say you can do whatever you want, right? And that Jesus isn't the point. Sounds like a lot of things that we hear today, does it not? Sounds like a lot of things we hear in our culture today. But Jude writes to them and says, look, I want you to contend for the faith. And in verses 5 through 16, he says, there's this stern warning, all these things that happened to people of old when they opposed God, watch and see what happened to them. Things like Sodom and Gomorrah and fallen angels and all these crazy little things. And he says, I want you to contemplate these things. Contend for the faith and contemplate what happens to those who oppose the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he moves down after verses 5 through 16 to verses 17 through 25. And he tells us to contend, to persevere, to continue in the faith. And so that's the big outline is to contend for the faith, right? And then to uh, contemplate the end result of those who oppose God. And then to continue what you're properly taught, to persevere in the gospel. And the whole point of this is so that the people will be built up, right? In verses 20 through 21, Jude asked the believers to build each other up by faith and prayer and to keep themselves in God's love and to be merciful while other people are sinning while they still fear God, that kind of hand-in-hand thing. And so what is Jude trying to teach us today? The very first thing I think Jude's trying to teach us today is to trust the God who is able to keep you. Trust the God, that's Jesus Christ, who is able to keep you. Now, this is a recurring theme in the New Testament, right? It's one of major three New Testament doxologies in different books. In Romans chapter 16, 25, a doxology, a praise and a worship of God, a praise and worship Him, or prayer that closes or opens something. This is what Paul says in Romans 16, 25. Now, to Him, that's God, who is able to establish, or another translation is to strengthen you in accordance with the gospel. There's a praise to God. That God is able to strengthen us. Okay? We move on to Ephesians 3.20. Now to Him, that's God, who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. That's what we say in prayer. According to His power that is work within us. Over and over and over, we see Paul, we see Jude, we see people praise God because God is able. He can do what you and I cannot do. Amen? Praise God, if he's just like me, I don't need to worship him and I don't need him. 
But praise God that even though he's just like me in his humanity, in his deity, Jesus Christ is fully God, just as he's fully man. And part of being deity, a part of being God, where Jude says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, right? Part of this issue of Godhood is his omnipotence, which is a big theological term for his almightiness, his all-powerfulness. God is able to do what you and I cannot do. He's able to pull off what in our best day, all together with all of our resources, we cannot do. He is able to keep us from stumbling and falling, right? He's all powerful. He's inherently powerful. That's his nature. He's infinitely power. He is able to do what we are unable to do. Jesus even spoke about this in the New Testament Gospels where he says, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are what? Possible, right? Jesus makes it clear, with men, we're limited. Things aren't possible at times, but with God, all things are possible. There's nothing that he cannot do, amen? He can do it all. And so Jesus, we see him dealing with a blind man, and it's an issue of whether we believe what God says, what Jude says here, that he's able to keep us from stumbling and from falling, right? Jesus dealing with a blind man in Matthew 9, 28 says, do you believe that I'm able to do this, that I'm able to give you your sight? That's what you want. Do you believe that I can do this? He's asking the man, do you doubt? Do you believe? Do you believe in my power? Do you believe in my power to do these things? This is the Jesus that walked on water. And when Peter didn't walk on water, Jesus saved him too to where he did. This is the Jesus that with very little food fed the 4,000 people in one setting and then fed 5,000 in another with very little food, right? This is the Jesus that healed the lame and the blind and the crippled and the deaf. This is the Jesus where the woman with the blood issue of 12 years is healed instantly by just touching his garment. This is the Jesus that when he wants to do something, he does it. Amen? There's nothing that God cannot do. He is omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful. There's nothing that's out of the realm of his power. There's nothing that he cannot accomplish. In the Old Testament, the the major prophet Jeremiah, in chapter 32, verse 17, Jeremiah says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arms. He created everything. He spoke and everything came into existence, right? But then the second part of that verse is, nothing is too hard for you. Now that should be an amazingly encouraging thing to you today. If you're struggling, if you're falling, if you're stumbling, if you're having a hard day, if you're having a hard week, if you're having a hard life, let's be honest, Jesus Christ can intervene in your life and do amazing things if we're willing to believe, if we're willing to follow him, if we believe that God can accomplish those things. He's able to keep us, right? And God tells us how he does it through a minor prophet, Zechariah, in chapter 4, verse 6. God says it's not by, he's talking about humans, it's not by might of people or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It's not going to be accomplished with, with armies and chariots and, and engineers and all those kinds of things. It's the spirit of God working, as we will see, in our inner person that strengthens us, that is able to keep us. That should be very encouraging to you that God's spirit with our soul can strengthen us and keep us, right? God is able to keep us, and we need to trust him to do that. The second thing I think this verse teaches, verse 24, is that God is able to to preserve you. God is able to preserve you throughout your faith journey. It's interesting that the first assurance from this doxology covers from earth to heaven, our entire spiritual journey, right? To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you. So it's, that's our earthly life when we're living here stumbling. And to present you before his glorious presence, that's in heaven, without fault and with great joy. God's not just saying that I kept you at this time, but I'm not going to keep you at this time. I kept you there, but I won't keep you here. God's saying throughout your faith journey, he initiated your salvation. He was seeking you when you had no room in your life for him at all. God initiated the salvation journey for you. 
He moved things around providentially in your life. He helped you in your belief. You still choose. You cooperate with that. You choose. You accept him. But as he initiated and as he saved you and regenerated you, he continues to hold you and to keep you in your sanctification all the way up until heaven, which is the next part, which is your glorification, when you're complete and whole in Christ. Your entire faith journey, your entire spiritual journey, God is able to preserve you through it all. Now, the old King James translates it now to him who's able to keep you from falling, stumbling in the IV, falling in the King James, stumbling precedes falling, but both are part of losing one's way. But the original tense of the sentence and the original language is this. It's one of emphasis. It's emphatic that God is able to do this. It's like Jude is preaching declaratively and strongly that God is able to do this. It's emphatic in the Greek. There's no question in Jude's mind that Jesus Christ can keep us and that he will keep us, right? God is able to keep us on our feet. The original word here is this idea of, of a military term of someone keeping guard, of watching from harm. And God is on the guard for you and I. He keeps watch over our souls. He's known as the great shepherd, the great overseer of our souls. Isn't that great? Doesn't that make you feel good? That no matter where you're at on your spiritual journey, whether God's part of your life or not, whether you're thinking about that, God's involved in keeping watch over your soul. If you don't know Jesus Christ, to draw you unto him, the way that John chapter 6 says. But if you have Jesus Christ in your life and a personal relationship with him that leads to your salvation, then he's keeping watch over your soul to make sure that you make it, to make sure that you continue on. That's a powerful thing where God is busy, right? Now, this, this power of God, it, it's not only just his power, it's also everything that he knows. He knows and sees all things past, present, and future. 1 John 3, 20 says, If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, for he knows everything, is the last clause. For he knows everything. In the Old Testament, knew both, it says that everything will be laid bare before God, that there's nowhere to hide, that there's nothing that we can keep from him, that he knows all things. Jesus, in talking about prayer, said, before you mention words upon your lips, God knows what you need in advance, right? So don't get wordy like the Pharisees. Don't get out on the corners making yourself look good with these high and exalted prayers. Because God knows what you need before you even speak it. He knows what's on your heart. God knows everything, and he's all-powerful, and so he knows what we're going to do. He knows what we need, and he's able to keep us unto himself, right? He's able to keep us on our feet. We may stumble, but that's a lot different than falling, right? It's this idea of sure-footedness. It was used for horses that were really good on hard trails, and biblically, it's used to describe falling into error or temptation or sin, and I'm telling you folks, having lived as a believer for 40 years, as well as the biblical record, there is no way for you and I to do it on our own. Anybody who teaches you other than that, Paul would use a very hard saying. He would say they're accursed because that is not the gospel. The gospel is it's Jesus plus what? Nothing. Amen. Praise you guys for saying that. And praise God. Jesus plus nothing. We desperately need God, right? We desperately need him to keep us fresh and prone we are prone to trip and stumble and fall spiritually but god is able to keep us from falling psalms 121 3 he will not let your foot slip now if you read psalms 121 and i want you to encourage you to read that this week it's a short tiny little psalm at the end of the psalter book as you read it that entire psalm is about and it fits coloradoans right it fits it says where do I look for my help? I look unto the hills, unto the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He will not let this. Oh, wait, God's asleep. No, God does not slumber. He does not sleep. He's carefully watching over you, and he will help you and preserve you. That's the entire record, not only in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. God can and is able to keep us from error and sin. I don't mean perfection, I don't mean not sinning, but he's able to help us to replace error with truth that his spirit teaches us through his word. 
He's able to keep us from false teachers that were infecting Jude's group of people, right? He's, they were leading them away from God's people, and God's Spirit, along with His Word, is able to keep us on the truth. Now, folks, we have a part to, co- to contribute to this. We have a part that we cooperate with God. That's more an accurate way of saying it. We need to discipline ourselves to be people of the book. We need to discipline ourselves to do what it takes to understand. And I, I freely admit to you, this is not always an easy book to understand. I have an entire library of commentaries by scholars to help understand this. And I spend a lot of time on it so that I don't give you the wrong junk, right? I am accountable to God for giving you the truth. And when I lead you into error, I am accountable before God. And that's a scary thing if I do so. And so I spend a lot of time. We just looked at Titus about being part of sound teaching, sound doctrine. We need to know this book. And the reason we need to know this book is because God is the God of this book. And when we know this book, we know the heart, the mind, the very essence of our God. He's he's self-revealed it to us through the scriptures. And that's why it's important for us to do that. And as we cooperate with him, he helps keep us from falling away. Now, there's another reason that sometimes um, when we look, let's be honest about this. When we look, we see people, Greg, this is great. Love your sermon. It sounds great. It's encouraging. But what about so-and-so that walked away from the faith? Have you ever known somebody like that? I've told you all before that I served in our previous church with a man that was well-known. He was an ex-colonel in charge of security for NATO command, a great guy. He did a wonderful job, and he was an amazing leader in Sunday school and spiritual stuff and all that thing, right? But over time, over a long period of time, he fell away from the faith to where you're like, I don't even recognize this guy. Is this the same guy that I served with all those years that did these wonderful things for God? How's that possible, right? And so we ask ourselves these tough questions from our experience. What about these guys? God says he can keep you. What about these guys? First John answers that. First John chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. If they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belong to us. John is writing to a group of believers that are under severe persecution. And he's talking about these people that truly leave the fold never really knew God. God doesn't keep them because they don't belong to him. And so this is a real problem that John deals with. In fact, 1 John deals with this idea that there is sins that we can do that can lead unto death, that God has to to remove us off the earth because we're doing so much bad, so to speak. And I know that's not the proper theology of it, but the issue is this, that if you're doing certain particular sins and it's harming God's cause, he may have had to, in rare cases, this wouldn't be the norm, this isn't what you should be afraid of, it's not you, but in a severe, severe case, God may take somebody home so that they don't continue to sin. So 1 John deals with some very difficult things. Very difficult things. And one of those is, what about the dude that was one of us? He's walked away from us and he has nothing to do with God again. Well, he deals with it. They were never really part of us, right? We cannot live the life of Christ. We cannot win the victory of obedience on our own. We need Jesus. The three enemies of our souls laid out in the New Testament are the world system, the devil, and the sin principle that still sticks around like guerrilla warfare with us. Romans 12 tells us that we should not be squeezed into the mold of this world. Instead, we should renew our minds as an act of worship. The world is constantly trying to tell us what matters and what to pay attention to. And we're told by God in 1 John 2.15 not to love the world or anything in the world. He's not talking about good things like babies and lollipops and a good roast beef. That's not what he's talking about. Those are things that are gifts from God that God says, give thanks unto God for those things. They're a blessing, right? He's talking about the world system that says all the time, we don't need Jesus. We don't need God. And if we need God, it's not Jesus, the one and only true God. 
We ourselves are God, right? That's what our world system tells us all the time is be your own man, be your own woman, or in today's world, be whatever you want to be. Everything in between, whatever that is, right? And when you're doing that, you can do that on your own. That's what the world system tells us. The media feeds that to us in a million different ways, right? Don't have an apple, have a Big Mac. This is more yummy. Well, it may be more yummy, but as certainly as any nutritious person can tell you, is not good for your body, right? You ever seen that, that thing on Netflix that was out a few years ago about the dude who ate nothing but McDonald's food? And this isn't a sermon against McDonald's. I just ate there this week, okay? But he ate nothing but McDonald's for like 30, 60 days. I forget how long it was. And they followed his blood work. And like halfway through the experiment, he's a college kid doing this, the doctor said, you're done, the experiment's over, you're going to croak, dude. Look at your blood work. Man, look at the, the lipids that you got. Look at this and look at that and all that. And so he stopped the experiment early because it was killing him from the inside out, right? The world tells us that fake things are good things. It tells us lies, like our lives are private. What we do in our own bedroom is up to us. When God tells us that a relationship between one man and one woman committed to each other for life is a blessing, the world tries to feed us the falsities of pornography and prostitution and adultery and, and do whatever you want to do as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. That's nonsense. It destroys people's lives. It destroys families. We need to heed this warning in all areas of our lives, right? The media fills our minds with the world system telling us lies, telling us falsities. And Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, that we need to take captive every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we get too wrapped up in the world system, and that's a problem. And dealing with the devil, Jesus in the desert told us how to deal with the devil. He knew Scripture inside and out. You say, well, we don't need the Bible. That's interesting because Jesus needed the Bible all the time, and he wrote it. He wrote it. And yet he uses Scripture to deal with the devil. The devil takes Scripture and twists it. And Jesus takes Scripture and uses it appropriately and sends him on his way. Get out of here, dude. I'm going to worship the one only true God. I'm not going to do those things, your three temptations, right? God promises that he will empower us to keep from falling. So if you think that you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation is overtaking you except what is common to man. And this is the part of 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13. God is faithful. He, that's the emphasis on him, not you. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 and 13. God strengthens our inner man by providentially controlling our circumstances of what's in our world and what tempts us. Have you ever felt like there's no way I can beat this desire, this craving, this thing? It's true. If you've ever had a sin that just really owns you, it's powerful. It's hard. But God says that these things are common among humanity and that he will provide a way for you to escape. And if it's a promise from God, it's true. So he sets things up providentially, right? And yet another part of Scripture indicates that God strengthens our inner man. In Ephesians 3.16, what does it say? God is able through the Spirit to strengthen. The prayer of Paul is to strengthen our inner person, our new nature inside. Now you should take this another step further. Jesus spent time, and we've looked at that, in John 17, the high priestly prayer of Christ. Jesus spent time praying for his disciples, right? He spent time praying for us that would come after his disciples. Read John 17, you'll see that. Jesus spent time praying for people all the time. In fact, you'll see in Luke chapter 22 that Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked. That's like a permission thing, right? Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that you will be strengthened and that which you will turn back and you will strengthen the brothers. Jesus is our high priest 
who sits at the right hand of the Father, according to Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. And he intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit, according to Romans 8, intercedes with us the groans of things that we don't even understand. And they intercede for us that we may make it. They intercede for us to keep us from falling. It's very strong that Jesus has this powerful prayer life. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, you will strengthen your brother. Scripture teaches that we have a sympathetic high priest, the book of Hebrews says, that's been tempted in every way, and so he understands our weaknesses, and he knows how to pray. And Scripture tells us continually how to deal with the devil. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. James chapter 4. And then the end of the matter is this, Philippians 1, 6, where it says this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it. That's God's side. He who began a good work with you will carry it on to completion. That's Jesus. Jesus has you in the palm of his hand and will hold on to you because you belong to him and because his spirit resides within you. You cooperate with that. You work along with God, but it is God that has the power who is able to keep you from stumbling. And then it says, this third thing that this passage teaches, that God is able to present us perfect in heaven. The second part of this verse, right? And to present you before him, his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. That should encourage your hearts this morning that, that someday, no matter what our struggle is now, no matter whether it's of the flesh or whether it's of our soul or whether it's an addiction or whether it's this, that, and the other, our lusts, our cravings, whatever it is that we struggle with as believers, there's going to be a day when that will be no more. Isn't that good stuff? Let me tell you what. Do you ever just open your mouth in a relationship that's important to you? And you mean to say something good to bless the other person, and out comes Mr. or Mrs. Ugly? You ever do that? My wife says something to me, and I mean to say something good that's going to build our relationship, that's going to make my life good, make her life good, and suddenly I, bleh, what in the world, Right? What in the world? The thought that runs in my head is, where did that come from? You ever had that thought? Where did that come from? Where did I, uh, with your boss, I should not have said that. With the elders, I should not have said that. Thank God for their goodness and their grace to me. God is working in our lives, and eventually he's going to get us to a place that we will be in his presence, his glorious presence without fault and with great joys. This is good news. His divine omnipotence is at work on our behalf, both in this life and the life to come. God is able to keep us from falling down here and to present us to himself blameless up there. And there's a little bit of a play of words on here. The idea in the original language is to make a stand. God is able to keep you from falling so that you will be able to make a stand before him. He doesn't just keep you from falling and carry you along as your bumbling feet. He makes you sure-footed to where you can stand spiritually before him without fault in his glorious presence. Perfect, blameless. You say, where do you get that from? 1 John 3, 2. But when the Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Jesus is perfect. And his completely perfect work on the cross on our behalf is the very thing that makes sure that we, being united with him spiritually, in union with Christ, that the end game for us is that when we get to heaven, we shall be faultless and blameless. That gives me great courage to keep trying today to live for that now. If that's where my end game is, what I'm supposed to be in perfection... The scriptures tell me in the book of Romans that I'm to be striving for that now. And if God's going to keep me from falling, it should encourage me to keep running, to keep walking. The way that Paul says in Galatians chapter 5 that keep in step with the Spirit. If you're in the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. Keep going. It should encourage you in your walk in Christ. Jesus is the one who's going to make us perfect because he himself was perfect and his perfect blood was shed on our behalf for you know that it was not with perishable things or gold or silver that you're redeemed from your empty way of life 
handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You and I are not blameless now, but we will be blameless then. When what we have in Christ now, our union with Him, comes to fruition, to its full consummation, and God restores everything, the new heaven, the new earth, and we are made in His robes of righteousness, we shall be perfect, we shall be blameless, we shall be everything that we're supposed to be and we're meant to be. We can and should be blamed for our many sins, even harmful ones. We cannot clean up what we messed up, but God is able to present us to Himself at the end perfectly faultless and joyful and clean. And how can He do that? He can do that because of His own sacrifice of His Son Jesus on our behalf. In the Old Testament, that, that lamb that was picked out, that was perfect and without blemish and white and everything was great, that was the one that you sacrificed. And it was a foreshadowing, pointing ahead down through time to Jesus Christ, who would be the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, as the prophet John said. Folks, we will be blameless, we will be faultless at the end of time, and God will have great joy because of His work. Not because of something we do, but because of His work. God cannot, in His omnipotence, not finish His work. He began a good work in us, and if Philippians 1, 6 is right, and he's going to bring it to completion at the end, then he must finish the work in us. Well, doesn't that give you encouragement? You ever think you should spend time thinking about what will you be like in heaven? We're not all going to be the same. You still have remnants of your personality. They're just perfected, and all the junk is rubbed out, right? What will you be like in heaven? Get a glimpse of that vision in your soul and help God through prayer ask you to help you to be that person now, right? We're to be working towards that. If that's where we're going to be and we're to be working towards that now, we need to do that, right? God tells us why he will have great joy, right? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, Ephesians 1, 4 says. It's that old hymn, my hope is built on nothing less. How many of you know that hymn? You know that hymn, right? As soon as I say the words, I bet some of you can start singing it in your heads, right? This is one of the stanzas. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne, right? That is good theology of that old hymn that captures what this passage is saying here. And the big part is, I love this part where it says, we will experience great joy at being faultless and perfect, right? But it's not only us having great joy, I think we understand why we will, but God will have great joy. We'll be joyful because we'll be free of the sin nature and its effects and this filthy world and the devil. We have obvious joy because we're free of those things that come after us and try to hold us back. But Jesus will have great joy, right? And Psalm 16, 11 tells us, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Boy, that matches up exactly with Jude 24. We will stand before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. And why? The second part of that verse with eternal pleasures. Psalm 16, 11 at your right hand. Our joy will be huge, but it will be overcome by God's joy because what does God want? God wants His people. He made us in the Garden of Eden at the beginning of time to be with Him. He made us to have perfect fellowship with Him. He made us to hang out in the garden and to play and do all that stuff and to be with God. He meant us to have that perfect fellowship when we were perfect. And we broke that, and we made the fall in the world. And God cleans up our mess and restores everything to be imperfect. But the God who made us to have that fellowship with Him is desperate to restore us to that fellowship with Him. Can't you just see that Jesus smiles over you? If you think, Greg, this is fuzzy-headed stuff, read Zephaniah 3.17. Zephaniah 3.17, where the Scripture says that God sings over you. He sings over you. He's so happy. 
God sees the end of the game that we're in. He has the greatest joy because as Hebrews 12, 2 says, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, he's the pioneer, the beginner, and the what? The perfecter of our faith. He has great joy. It says in this text that for the joy sent before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God for the great joy that he was going to have of having his people back in relationship with him. He went to the cross to provide the means for that. Do you not understand? And I guarantee you as I'm studying this, I don't let it sink down to my bones how much God loves me. This week I had the pleasure of going out and visiting with a man who is currently dying. And it was a pleasure. And I had visited with him before and I've shared the gospel. And we went over the gospel for about 40 minutes in depth. And we talked, and I had talked to him. I said, in heaven, it will be this way. And in heaven, you can be this way. And in heaven, your loved ones like this that know you. And in heaven, and you should have seen his face go from like this to like this. He could see it in his mind's eye. What 1 Corinthians says, no mind is, has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. No eye has heard, I mean, no eye has seen, no ears heard. No mind has conceived what God's prepared for those who love him. If we spend time thinking about that, how much God loves us and how he desires for us to be in fellowship with him, both now and in the next life, it's everything, man. It's everything. It will drive us to try to rely upon him to become more holy, right? To become more holy. Because God is able to restore us and to renew us and wants to have joy unspeakable and as we say in the old song, full of glory is joy. God is able to keep us from falling and to present us to himself at the end of time full of faultlessness, perfection, glory. Do we have a part to play in that? Yes, we do to cooperate with God. God does the work. God initiates it. God continues it on. God finishes it, but he asks us to cooperate with him. That's what the spiritual disciplines, as means of grace. That's what I wish people should think about. A lot of people times, people think of spiritual disciplines, and they're, oh, I don't like discipline, I don't like hard work, and all that stuff. What if you thought about it as a glorious feast? Your time with the Lord in his word is a glorious feast. It is a glorious feast where you and him meet, hopefully every day, and you get alone with the God who loves your soul and wants to feed you, and you receive a good meal from him spiritually in his word and in prayer. He talks to you. You talk to him. You have this relationship, right? You worship him. You worship him. When I'm alone with God, I'm not afraid to, to sing, and I'm a, I'm a really bad singer. You guys know that, right? But sing to God, I do, because he is worth it. He is worth it, and he loves me. And I, I desire to get together with him regularly. It is a means of grace, where God's grace flows through the spiritual disciplines that he's asked us to do and meets our deep, deep needs. Wherever it was that you could have a seven-minute quiet time, that should be gone. What kind of nonsense is that? How do you put a time limit on being with God? When I'm enjoying a great date with my wife, I don't want it to end, folks. I'm sorry. I don't want it to end. When I'm enjoying the time of God, I don't want it to end. Right on a sweet day with him, I don't want it to end. Where did we get this idea that if I do my quiet time, I'm a good person, I check the box? That's nonsense. That's something we put upon it. That's American functionalism imposed upon the scriptures. The scriptures talk about it as a relationship, of being in a relationship with God. But as we close this time, we've got to understand that for God to keep you and to present you faultless, for you to have that sweet relationship with him, you have to enter into a relationship with him first. Some of you here today that 
that hear about Jesus, that have gone to church, that have done all these things, that are religious, all those things, but, but you've never made a decision. It's a choice of your will to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's something you choose. That you choose to believe what God says. That you and I have a sin problem that separates us from God. And that Jesus came to fix that sin problem. That he lived the perfect life that you and I can't live. That he died on the cross in his perfectly shed blood that we just saw in 1 Peter 18 and 19. That it covers our sins. And he gives us his perfection, his righteousness. It's a spiritual exchange. But we get that exchange by a choice of the will. You can't inherit it from your Christian parents. You can't inherit it by coming to church. It doesn't rub off on you like a disease. You don't catch it like you catch a cold. You choose Jesus Christ. You choose to enter into a relationship like I chose Kim. And I chose to be in a relationship with her and to enter into that relationship and to commit myself exclusively to her and to have her as my wife, right? You choose. And so if you're here today and you've never chosen Christ, I just invite you, the God that loves you, that sings over you. I'm telling you, look up Zephaniah 317. God sings over you. Look it up. Why would you turn that God down? It's simple. You just say in your heart, God, I agree with you about my sin. I have done these things. I have rebelled against you. I confess these sins, and I ask you, I ask you to come into my life. I trust you to take away all my sins and to give me your righteousness. I trust you. That's the key, the key point, trusting Christ. And then the Bible says if you do those things, you will be saved. You will have a relationship with Christ. And so if you're here this morning and you haven't done that, in a moment we're going to have an invitation. This is your time to do that. Why would you walk out of here without that? I told you this week, as glorious as this passage has been, with death calls. One moment, I'm telling you folks, if you're a mortician, if you're a police officer, if you're a doctor, if you're a minister, you learn a great truth. One moment you're here, and the next moment, you're not and about percent of the people know it's coming the rest of us have no clue how or when are you ready to meet Jesus if you're not today's the day of salvation accept this free gift of salvation if you're a believer how do I apply this to my life am I seeking out that daily relationship with Christ do I trust that he's going to keep me? Maybe I'm at a low point. Maybe I'm faltering in my faith. Maybe I'm struggling. Guess what? You're in good company. The rest of us are too. I've been at very, very low points that I didn't think I could hold on to God. And in fact, I didn't hold on to God. But God held on to me. He held on to me. And for some reason, by his goodness and his grace, I'm still here. When I was certain that I had nothing left to hold on to him. Maybe you're at that point or somewhere along that path. This is your time to meet up with God and to come to him and to receive his grace. You need an extra helping of his grace.